I decided to make a LED Christmas tree as a bit of a festive project uh, and to de demonstrate uh, some of the features of Locus 6 and uh, taking a project through from start to finish, really. Here is a schematic that I've drawn up of what my uh, Christmas tree is going to be able to do. I've used a, a PIC 16F88 processor, and this has um, it has 13 I/O lines, and there's an additional two that are tied to the oscillator. This device has an internal oscillator, so that gives us 15 um, output lines that can be used, as seen here, to connect to each of our 15 LEDs. Each LED is connected through a 120 ohm resistor um, and then it goes directly to the microcontroller pin. Uh, we power the, the whole circuit from a battery pack which can be anything from 3 to 5 volts. Uh, I wouldn't really advise going above 5 volts or below 3 volts. The first thing I needed to do when testing my Christmas tree was to rig up a simple programming flow code to allow me to check that the device is actually running. To do this, I, I added uh, the 15 LEDs on the tree to the flow code panel. And for each of the, L the LEDs, I assigned them the respective pin on the microcontroller. Uh, and I gave them a colour to match the colour of my LEDs on my tree. I then, um, to minimise on the external circuitry to, to drive the microcontroller, I decided to use the internal oscillator uh, so we don't need a, a crystal circuit. The internal oscillator on the device I'm using, which is the PIC16F88, uh, is um, is configurable to run at certain speeds. The default speed uh, can be found by looking at the uh, dead sheet for the 16F88. So here's the dead sheet. Uh, and if I look at the oscillator section uh, and then scroll down, uh, we eventually get to the description of the OSCOM register. Now this um, IRCF setting is basically the speed that the internal oscillator will run at. So what we need to do, um, you can see here that the default is 000, which corresponds to 31.25 kilohertz, which is the slowest speed. Really, we want to be at, at least 4 meg, probably 8 meg. So to do this, um, we need to work out what the hexadecimal code um, that we need to pass to this register is. So it's 111 to get 8 megahertz. So if we convert that into hexadecimal, we have um, we have 1, 2, 4. So 1 plus 2 is 3, plus 4 is 7. So we have 0x70. So in flow code, what we've done is we've used the C code icon. We've given it a comment, um, which is configure the internal oscillator to run at 8 megahertz. And then what we're doing is we're, we're writing to the OSCON register the value that is currently in the OSCON register or with our new configuration value. This basically means that any values that are in these four lower bits um, will be retained. Um, we could just write 0 times 70 to the OSCOM register, but then the, the bottom four bits may be um, corrupted by doing this. So if, this way, we're just setting the bits that we need um, to up the oscillator speed to 8 megahertz. Now, to test this out, um, I'm using what's known as a, a one-second flasher loop. 
And all this does is basically it, it turns on one of the LEDs, it waits for a second, it turns off the same LED, waits another second, and then repeat and start again. And this allows us to very easily check on the hardware to see if the delays are roughly equal to a second. If they are equal to a second, then we know that the device is running at the correct rate. Now in the build project options menu, you specify the clock speed. So you must make sure that this is correct for what you're expecting. Otherwise your delays won't be correct. The delays are all calculated based on this clock speed setting, so that's, that's really what you need to check. We also need to configure the device. And we do this using the configure tab. Now the default configuration is probably not what we want. Um, so there's a few things that we have to look for. The oscillator selection, well we're going to be using the internal oscillator. So from the list, we're using InterC, and then the AS port I/O basically allows us to use pins A6 and A7 as digital inputs and outputs, um, which we're using to drive some of the LEDs. So the setting we want is the InterC AS port I/O setting. Watchdog timer should be off. Uh, the watchdog timer will effectively reset your program unless told otherwise, uh, so it's always wise to keep it off. Power up timer, this is a good feature as it delays the processor for, from running for a few milliseconds while the uh, voltage is rising. And this allows the microcontroller to start cleanly. Um, so it's not starting up while the power supply is stabilizing. The master clear function, we want this to be um, switched off uh, so that the device will run even when the master clear signal isn't present. We can't use this as an output, unfortunately, because the master clear pin um, is, is an input only when in I.O. mode. Um, so we can't use it to drive an LED, but get switching it off here means that we don't have to provide power to it on our circuit. Uh, brownout detects basically detects if the input voltage drops below a certain threshold, and this will effectively reset the processor. Um, low voltage program mode is disabled. Uh, this basically eats one of your output pins uh, if it's enabled. So if one of your output pins isn't working, normally B3, um, this could be the setting to look for. Um, there's a re-protect, um, it's just whether or not uh, the EEPROM data is, is protected from being read back from a programmer, uh, so we don't care about that. Flash program write enabled, um, this is basically whether or not we can write to the flash memory on the device. Uh, we're not doing that in this program, but even if we were, we'd want that off. Uh, Background debug is uh, one of the microchip um, configuration options, uh, so we're not using that. CCP1 MUX pin, so that's our hardware PWM channel. Uh, where is that routed to? Uh, we're not using hardware PWM, so that doesn't matter. Code protect is whether or not a programmer can read back the code that we've stored in the microcontroller. So if it's off, it can be read back, um, or we could protect our code if we wanted to stop other people from being able to pull it out of the device. Uh, Failsafe clock monitor enabled. This basically switches the oscillator circuit if it detects that, um, say, a crystal, for example, failed. We're not going to be using that in this program. The internal external switchover mode allows um, the internal oscillator to kick in um, if the external oscillator fails. So we can switch between these two different oscillator modes. You could do this to maybe save power. Um, we've got this enabled, but we're, again, we're not using it. Um, so that's that's the setting for this device. For your own device, there'd be um, differences. To find out the details of the configuration, you can refer back to the device data sheet. Uh, I think it's in the special features, and then you've got configuration bits. And inside here, 
we've got the two registers, so config one and config two, and what the actual values will do. Um, and obviously there's the set of descriptions placed throughout the data sheet. So if I um, switch on the hardware now, you can see that the LED is flashing at roughly one second, one second on, one second off. So that's quite a nice sanity check to know that the, the hardware is running at the correct rate uh, as described in flow code. The next thing we want to test is that all of the LEDs on the Christmas tree are, are connected to the microcontroller pins correctly uh, and that we've got no shorts between LEDs um, and our signals. To do this, all I've done is I've created a loop that goes through the LEDs one by one, switches them on, waits for 100 milliseconds, switches that same LED off, and then moves to the next LED. So if I run this, uh, I should get a nice uh, running display that goes through every LED, switching it on and off. Now, if I put this on the hardware and one of the LEDs fails to light, then I can then use a multimeter to check the connectivity between the LED, the resistor, and the microcontroller pin. If two of the LEDs come on at once, then I know there's probably a short somewhere in the circuit. Uh, and again, I can use the multimeter to try and check for any shorts on our error board. This running on the hardware can be seen uh, as such. So each of the LEDs, we can see is lighting on its own, and this way we know that the signals to the LEDs are all correct before we start creating any um, effects to go on the LEDs. The next program I've created um, is an attempt to start to show some effects on the Christmas tree. What I've done to create this program is I've implemented um, a software PWM approach to drive all of the LEDs. To do this, I have enabled two timer interrupts. One timer interrupt drives the software PWM uh, to give us about a 78 hertz refresh rate. Uh, and the other timer interrupt uh, is for our transitions, which I'll get onto in a minute. So if I go into the uh, PWM, PWM interrupt, then it's this macro that's called here. And what we're doing is we're basically saying um, for each of the LEDs, we're going to uh, check to see if the timer count is zero, if it is, then um, is the LED enabled at all? Should we switch it on? Um, if the PWM value for the LED is greater than zero, then the LED should be switched on. Um, and we have another decision which checks to see if it's the end of the LED duty cycle. So, is the time account equal to the um, LED duty? If it is, then we switch off the LED because uh, we're currently at the end of that LED's duty. And then we move to the X LED and this loops through for all 15 LEDs. We then increment our period counter. So this is what is being used um, here to check against the start and end period for the LED. And then we say, um, has the time account reached the maximum period? Um, I think for this program, we've defined this as 50. So each LED can have one of 50 potential PWM duty cycle values 
uh, which should give us 50 different brightnesses we can set each LED to, ranging from fully off to fully on. If we go back to the main program, um, we've enabled the PWM interrupt, so next is the transition interrupt. The transition interrupt is basically a, a way of delaying for a certain amount of time. Um, and what we've done is we've randomized this a bit so that I go in here. What this macro is doing is it's looping through each of the LEDs. If the LED in the current loop so LED 0, then LED 1. If the LED is not equal to the required LED duty, then we go down this branch of the loop. And this basically says, is the um, LED duty greater than the required LED duty? If so, then we decrement the LED duty. And if the LED is less than the required LED, then we increment the LED duty, and then we move to the next LED until we've processed all 15 um, LEDs. The transition is randomized by uh, actually calling this randomized transition time as part of our main loop. Uh, so we're going to here. What we're doing is where we've got a, a time or two rollover variable, which is here. Uh, so it's global variable. Uh, and what we're doing is where we're looping. We, we set it to zero and then we loop while the value is less than 50. Uh, so we pass in a random number between zero and two by five. If that random number is below 50, we uh, keep going until we get one that's above uh, 50 or above. Uh, this allows the transition time to have a minimum uh, ti time to complete. Uh, if we allowed the time to roll over to go below 50, this would be a bit too quick um, and we might start getting um, transitions that are happening too fast. To assign this to the time to rollover, we've used a, a C code icon and the, the actual register on board the 16F88 to control the rollover time over two is PR2. And all we're doing is we're assigning that the um, C version of the flow code variable. So to do that, we capitalize, we add FCB underscore, and then the capitalized version of the rollover variable name. The rest of the program is basically just a, a loop where we collect a random value between zero and seven. And we store this into the mode variable. We then have a switch um, icon that switches the functionality depending on what the mode variable uh, is. So we have several modes. Uh, we have a mode to switch all the LEDs on, switch them all off, randomize each LED, uh, flip each LED. So an LED that's fully on will become fully off. Um, an LED that's partially on will stay partially on. Um, we've got a mode where some of the LEDs are switched on, some of them are switched off, some of them are randomized, and some of them are flipped. So those are the eight modes. And if I show you one of the modes, um, all we do is we loop through all 15 LEDs. We set the required LED to the PWM max, and then we move to the next LED. So this sets up all of the required LED values. We then have a, um, a random function to give us a random uh, amount of delay between zero and 255 milliseconds. 
uh, we don't have a randomised transition time call and we don't have a macro to wait for the transition to end. And inside here, all we're doing is we're looping through each LED to see if it is if its duty is at the required duty. If it is, then we decrement our counter. And if the counter reaches zero, then we drop out of this loop. And this just allows a, a very nice way of waiting for the um, sort of animation to finish. And if we go back to main, then we, we generate another random delay between zero and 255 milliseconds, uh, just to allow the, the display to settle. And then we, we loop back and we start again. Uh, so if I, if I show this on the simulation, then we get an idea of what's going to happen. You can see it's, it's, it's very random. Um, the problem with the simulation is it can't really do the high speed PWM um, control signals for the LED because uh, the screen only refreshes that. So 60 hertz um, to be able to actually show a dimmed LED actually requires um, much higher frequency than this. So uh, all we can really do is show the LED is on or off. Uh, but you do kind of get the idea of what the actual hardware will be doing. So here's the hardware loaded with the latest firmware. Uh, and if we switch it on, then we should get some random results. So the next step is to design a, a piece of 3D printed plastic that could sit over the front of this uh, to finish off the design and make it uh, a bit more robust to last long term. Uh, here's the back of the board for anyone who's interested. The full details of how to build this board are available on the Matrix Multimedia blog. Um, and that includes all of the examples that I've shown here, uh, the schematic, uh, and some tips on how to actually build the variable and circuitry.